Good day, and today we're going to look at Ernest Hemingway's Hills Like White Elephants. So we'll start by introducing you to the author Ernest Hemingway. Now, Ernest Hemingway was born on July 21st in 1899 in Cicero, now in Oak Park, Illinois. And Ernest Hemingway served in World War I and had worked in journalism before publishing his story collection In Our Time. He was renowned for novels like The Sun Also Rises, A Farewell to Arms, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and The Old Man in the Sea, which won the 1953 Pulitzer. In 1954, Hemingway won the Nobel Prize. However, he committed suicide on July 2nd, 1961, in Ketchum, Idaho. So let's start with our story, Hills Like White Elephants. It is set at a train station in Spain, and it's a brief snapshot of a young man and a young woman named Jig, who are traveling through Spain in the late 1920s. Now, the story is told from the objective point of view. It's nearly all dialogue. There is very little narrative intrusion. So your setting is the Ebro River and the hills that are behind. And so here we have the Ebro River in Spain. Now, clearly, the young couple are traveling about, enjoying youthful freedom and perhaps indulging a bit in the bohemian lifestyle. But there is conflict. Let's see if you can find the conflict in this exchange of dialogue. The girl was looking off at the line of hills. They were white in the sun and the country was brown and dry. They look like white elephants, she said. I've never seen one. The man drank his beer. No. You wouldn't have. I might have, the man said. Just because you say I wouldn't have doesn't prove anything. Are they really arguing about seeing a white elephant? Or might there be more, like an argument that we're not hearing between the two people? Well, it does seem like there's trouble in paradise. Jake seems discontented with their rootless existence. It tastes like licorice, the girl said, and put the glass down. Well, that's the way with everything. Yes, said the girl. Everything tastes of licorice, especially all the things you've waited so long for, like absinthe. Oh, cut it out. You started it, the girl said. I was being amused. I was having a fine time. Well, let's try and have a fine time. All right. I was trying. I said the mountains look like white elephants. Wasn't that bright? Yeah, that was bright. I wanted to try this new drink. That's all we do, isn't it? Just look at things and try new drinks. Now, absinthe, the ap alcoholic drink that Jig refers to in the story, was reputed to have psychoactive effects. It was also reputed to be poisonous if you overindulged in it. Now, because of these supposed effects, absinthe became popular among artists and those who thought of themselves as bohemians. It was supposed to make you more creative, be able to see more of the world. Now, of course, absinthe was popularly supposed to cause hallucinations. Now, as we can see, the legendary effects of absinthe are even still being touted today. So then what really is the conflict between the two young lovers in Hills Like White Elephants? It's really an awfully simple operation, Jig, the man said. It's not really an operation at all. The girl looked at the ground the table legs rested on. Well, I know you wouldn't mind it, Jig. It's really not anything. It's just to let the air in. The girl did not say anything. Well, I'll go with you, and I'll stay with you all the time. They just let the air in, and then it's all perfectly natural. So what kind of operation could he be talking about? You've got to realize, he said, that I don't want you to do it if you don't want to. 
I'm perfectly willing to go through with it if it means anything to you. Doesn't it mean anything to you? We could get along. Well, of course it does. But I don't want anybody but you. I don't want anyone else. And I know it's perfectly simple. So our critic Kenneth Johnson remarks that this man identified only as an American is essentially the villain of the piece. He's being selfish and insensitive, and he's being an emotional bully, the eternal adolescent who refuses to put down roots or shoulder responsibilities that are rightfully his. His empty, barren lifestyle is summed up by the girl. This is all we do, isn't it? Just look at things and try new drinks. Now, again, what is he trying to emotionally bully her to do? What kind of operation could this be? So the girl stands up and walks to the end of the station. Now across on the other side were fields of grain and trees along the banks of the Ebro. Far away beyond the river were the mountains. The shadow of a cloud moved across the field of grain, and she saw the river through the trees. We could have all this, she said, and we could have everything, and every day we make it more impossible. So the short description of the Valley of Ebro suggests something to Jig. It's an image of life's possibilities. Now, Doris Lanier remarks that critics generally agree that the brown, dry, and infertile land represents a rootless, empty, and sterile life, like the one the couple is presently living. While the fertile land along the Ebro River represents a meaningful and fruitful life they could have if they would not go through with the abortion. So as Jig is looking across the very fruitful and fertile land of the Ebru River, saying we could have all of this, we could create a family, we could be together and create something together. And yet we have this emotional bully of the American who wants this rootless life, the brown and dry infertile land like at the train station. Now, the title of the story refers to a white elephant. How is that significant? Well, the white elephant is an English idiom. So when we take a look at a white elephant with our critic Kenneth Johnson, he says that in one meaning of the term is something that's rare, something that's expensive, something that's difficult to keep or a burdensome possession. So it's an object that is no longer esteemed by its owner but it still has value to others. This is basically how the man feels about the unwanted child. How it's rare and expensive, but it's also difficult to keep and a burdensome possession. So then we look at the sense of imagination here. Now these two young people are at a time in their lives when they're free and independent. They can travel, they can explore the world. It's a time when people often feel the world is theirs for the taking. They can imagine an exciting future for themselves. Now travel itself is often said to be mind expanding and seeing new places and experiencing new things adds to one's ideas of the possibilities of life. Again, the absinthe that they could be drinking could also talk about being mind-expanding and seeing new places and experiencing new things. Now, for the young American, having a baby clearly would be an impediment to this free and rootless lifestyle that he wants at this moment. As he tells Jig, but I don't want anybody but you. I don't want anyone else. So is it fair to say that the young man cannot imagine having a baby at this point in his life? Now, when we look at Jig's viewpoint, she remarks to her lover, doesn't it mean anything to you? We could get along. Now, earlier in the story, Jig has an epiphany as she gazes at the fertile valley of the Ebro River, and she says, and we could have all this, and we could have everything, and every day, we make it more impossible. So what is it that they're making more impossible? Is it a future together? Is it a life that is something more than just this freewheeling journey from place to place, this rootless existence? 
Now, clearly, when it comes to the baby in question, Jig has more imagination than the young man. She can imagine a life with the child, while he cannot. So then what happens after the story ends? There is clearly tension between the couple as the story comes to an end. Do you feel better, he asked. I feel fine, she says. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. Why would she have to repeat that unless she's trying to convince herself? It's not very convincing. So then what do you think will happen? Do you think she'll go and get her operation? If she does or if she doesn't, will they get over this little incident? Do you think they'll stay together in the long run? I mean, there's very clear tension at the very end of this story. Perhaps they'll get back together. But with the tension at the end, it seems very unlikely. Thank you so much for stopping by to learn a little bit more about Ernest Hemingway's Hills Like White Elephants. If you'd like to discuss more about Hills Like White Elephants, I also have a video going through the themes, the motifs, and all the imagery. I also have several other stories, not only about Ernest Hemingway, but by other authors on my channel. Thanks for stopping by.